All right. As as you probably know, this topic is very close to why I. It's one of the major reasons, probably, that I put my hand up to be the president of the Finch Society of Australia and have got involved in aviculture at government level and all that sort of stuff, is because this is some. It's a personal thing for me, and I hope. And there's, I know some other people who are in this room are very keen on it too. Um, we're extremely lucky in Australia because we are able to keep native, our native birds in captivity. That's not the case in most other countries. In the US, you can't keep any native birds. In most of Europe, you can't keep any of the native birds. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but you're not supposed to keep any of the native birds. And what that's done to American aviculture is, look, I don't know for sure, so I might be overstating it, but it's basically meant that it's a pet industry. It's about pets. So they have pet Gouldian finches and they have pet parrots. Whereas here, yes, we have the pet side of it, but for most of us, <coughs> it's about breeding a new species, breeding a new, establishing a new mutation, or you know, once we've, or, 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 or making it so that we can breed them for multiple generations and, and, and have a sustainable population within our aviaries which is exactly what this endangered species stuff is about when they're breeding, breeding them in captivity and trying to recover endangered species. So what I'm going to talk about, and I gave this talk last Friday actually to QFS and I'm going to give it at Wollongong and there's a couple of other clubs, probably I'm doing a similar thing down in Adelaide at the convention that they have. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what is happening now? What have we already done? Like the Red Siskin Initiative is one example. What I think needs to happen, and why in the world would we want it to happen? Um, so that's basically the three areas we're going to look at. Um, what is happening? Heaps of stuff, heaps of stuff, and we're not very good at promoting ourselves. We stand around and we, you know, and we and we keep it to ourselves, but we're going to get in trouble if we don't let people know. So we've got to first of all acknowledge what it is that we're doing. Um, and that's what I mentioned before. We're already conserving species in aviculture. There's a lot of them that we've done. I mean, I know I'm looking at Bob and John Martin. I know they're working with Peking robins at the moment. Now, Peking robins are not an endangered species in the wild, but they're an endangered species in captivity in Australia. And exactly what these guys are doing with Peking robins and Joe Cavill's doing with blue caps and various other people in this room are doing in their own little way with the species with their mates is exactly what people do with endangered species. It's just that we do it unofficially and we don't get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by government to do it. Um, so we're already doing this. We already know how to do it. Um, we're also doing stuff to help formal program, the, the Red Siskin Initiative, the Save the Gouldian Fund, the Black, Black Freight Recovery Work, and there's lots of other examples all, all over the world um, where aviculture is helping with formal programs. And behind the scenes, there's stuff going on the soft, with the softbill people, with zoos, where they're working in, in conjunction with zoos. Softbills are one area where birds are moving in and out of, between private aviculture and, and the zoo community quite regularly, simply because the zoos want what private people have got and they can't get it from other places. Whereas the stuff that we've got, yes, the zoos are buying the stuff that we've got, but they're sort of in the box suit to buy it. They don't have to come begging to us. Um, they can go to dealers and, and, and commercial breeders to buy the stuff. Um, we have to acknowledge that what we, know, what, what, what we do is actually the same as the captive breeding efforts that are, that are done by zoos. In fact, we, not in every case, I'm not saying the zoos don't do, a, don't do a good job, they do do a good job, but we do an exceptional job. We do an exceptional job. We know every individual bird in general. I mean, there are some bigger people here who don't. But we know where every nest is. We know whether they're fertile eggs or not fertile eggs. We know the intricacies of each cock in our aviary or, the, or each pair in our aviary. A lot of the captive breeding stuff in zoos and, and, and you know, that's, they don't. They're not necessarily, look, a lot of them are, don't, don't get me wrong. A lot of the zoo people are fantastic too. A lot of them are, were, were aviculturists at the start who went and got a job at the zoo. But in other cases, it's not, it's not the case. But we need to sell ourselves. Um, so some examples. 
establishing or re-establishing um, species in aviculture. Um, so there's the stuff, I mean, a, a couple of I know this club's done stuff in the past, we're not, we haven't got anything active at the moment, but the Queensland Finch Society Silverbill Program. Now that, wasn't, that, that was a species that was, that, that was becoming rare in Australia, but the process that, went, that they went through to get, I think there's over 70 people involved in that program, there's people who say, if we let, um, say, if we let every, you know, a, a dozen of us all have a pair of whatever it is, I'll say Plains Wanderers as an example, or yellow chats or some other endangered species that's going to be extinct if nobody does anything, that they're concerned that if we put them out and a dozen of us all get a pair of these things, that somehow we're going to breed a few of them and we're going to sell them for millions. Well, you know what? That program shows that that's not the case. That has not happened at all. Nobody ran off with them and flogged them off and, and, and tried to make a quid. And they're doing the same thing with the Rufus backs, I think now, and Yellow Siskins in Queensland. And I know there are other programs going on around the club. But the thing is, that's exactly the same process that zoos do formally between different zoos. There's no difference. It's just the same. It's just that the zoo system is formalised and it's written down. But you know what? It ain't rocket science. It ain't rocket science, um, what they're doing either. Um, and we cooperate. I mean, a lot of people do it, particularly the rarer species. I know, well, if I use John, John and Bob sitting there standing in front of me with the, with the Peking Robins, there's probably only, I don't know, maybe there's half a dozen people in the country that have got them. And I'm sure they know all of them. And they know who's got them and they know what bloodlines there are and all the rest of it. That's no different to the half a dozen zoos that are involved in whatever endangered species program. In fact, there's more of you guys involved in it and the birds are more spread out. In some cases, like for instance the region honey eaters, they're all at Taronga. Um, there are some other species where there's a couple of zoos involved, um, but it's no different. Um, skills required to establish strong lines of new mutations. So there's a lot of people in there, there's quite a number of blokes in this room sitting in front of me who are, mu who are keen on, I mean it's not something that I'm keen on at the moment, in the past I have been, I've read a lot of Gouldia mutations years ago, but that's the same process too. So, for instance, the, the, these fawn painteds, I don't know whether you've seen them. I know um, Alf Watts had a whole heap at Fairfield, you might have seen them there. That's, I think, Craig Smealy got them going for a bit and then Gary McRae got them going and spread around. I know there's people in this room who've had, um, probably shed a few tears over the bloody things because they've lost a lot of them or they've had infertile eggs. There's other people who've had more success. Um, but the, pr the fact is, the, the process of establishing a new mutation such as the fawn painted or whatever it is, um, Australian yellow Gouldian or maybe even these Australian blues that are, that are, you know, people seem to be going for now, which I don't really float my boat. But the point is you're trying to make a stronger bird and you're, and you're trying to make sure that you, you know, outcross and all the rest of it to, keep, to, to, to end up with a, bird, a, a sustainable mutation. And that's exactly the same as what's happening with captive breeding programs too. So the point I'm trying to make is we're already doing all this stuff. We already know how to do all that. Um, it's identical management and skills to the skills required for endangered species captive breeding programs. Absolutely identical. There's no difference. They just write it all down. So they end up with a 200 page document called the captive reco you know, the recovery plan for the Mali Emu in or whatever it is. It's 300 pages. But you know what? The 300 page document that's sitting on all these people's desks doesn't breed the Mali emu wren. It's just a pile of paper. Whereas we're actually breeding the birds and we're actually doing it successfully. So, and this is my argument, it's like, people have been paid God knows how much money to prepare these 300 page documents, but the birds are still dying. They're still not breeding, they're not having any success. Obviously, this document has a lot more in it than just captive breeding. It's all about habitat and there's a lot of other issues as well, obviously the reason that the bird became endangered in the first place. And that's sort of beyond our, that's not our charter. Our charter is to just breed the things in captivity when they get to a point that the, the population is not sustainable in the wild. Um, so here's a couple of examples where aviculture has been involved. So the Gouldian finch, um, whether you, we, or we, a lot of people these days are focusing, quite a number of people in this room, focusing on maintaining wild type birds. Um, so that's almost like it's a new mutation, like it's a skill 
to get wild type birds and eradicate all the all the mutations out of the stock that you've got. I had an aviary, I don't know when it was, probably 15 years ago when I was at Parramatta, that I thought just had normal um, orange or yellow headed birds in it. And after, I mean, I had, and, and, and it bred true for about 10 years. And then one year I got a white breast, and the next year, mate, they were everywhere. Half, it seemed like half the birds were white breasts. Um, so there's a skill to Matt being able to get rid of that mutation too. Um, but it's good to see that there are people focusing, and not just guildians, but focusing on wild type um, birds as well to maintain them. Because when you're talking to, to government, although I can see the benefit of breeding mutations, they don't see that. They don't see that. For instance, well, you remember John when we saw the US ambassador and we're in the meeting, we we're talking about this sort of stuff. And when John mentioned Peking Robins, his immediate response was, oh, well, they're not endangered. Almost like, well, they're not endangered. Why would you make around with them? Now, yes, in terms of saving that species in the wild, he's absolutely right. If, if, the, if the borders are open, we could import them. But to me, that's not the point. I mean, look, I like Peking Robins, don't get me wrong. But the point is the process that's, that's been gone through to breed Peking Robins and from such a small population to re-establish them in aviculture in, in Australia is exactly the same as getting a small population of some you know, endangered species, Malium urens or something, and getting them up into, um, into a decent population too. Um, the Save the Gouldian Fund, a little controversial, I know, there's, uh, we've talked about it, there's some things we agree with, some things we don't, but you know what, one thing that I think that, that, that I would say about the Save the Gouldian Fund, it has raised the status of Australian aviculture across the world and in this country. There's no doubt about that. Since I've been president here, the number of projects that have nothing to do with Save the Gouldian Fund, but that people have contacted Australian finch breeders, often it's through Mike. I mean, I have, I've had some arguments with, with Mike Fiddler in the, last, in the last 12 months, but in the last few years. I, I think we get on all right. Um, there's some things I don't, don't agree with him with, but I think the fact that this organisation exists and that so much work was put into it is absolutely a positive for, for Australian agriculture. It really has promoted us. So it's um, worth following just for that. Um, there's other Gouldian finch work going. You've probably heard of stuff at the Mariba wetlands. Um, we're there breeding and releasing birds. Have been doing it for a long time. Not sure just how successful that is, but I mean, it's a private organisation doing it, isn't it? Same as Save the Gouldian Fund is. Um, there's two private landholders in North Queensland. Actually, when Kevin was here, Kevin Devney, he mentioned John Griffith's thing. Um, it wasn't, I, I thought at the time it was Mariba Wetlands and it seemed a little more odd. In actual fact, it's, it's, it's one property that's about 400 kilometres north of where Mariba is, and it's another property, I think, inland from Cairns. But they're private landholders hold, land that are breeding Gouldians in big aviaries. Um, oh, there's a picture of jump. So that's the Save the Gouldian Fund facility at um, ANU in Canberra, where we visited with when Warren was here from um, the from the US, the Red Sisk and stuff. Um, so that's a fantastic research facility. Um, but I'm not. It's fantastic for, for for learning all sorts of stuff. I'm not sure just how how related it is to to what we do because it's a very scientific sort of way of breeding finches. Um, but it's no doubt it's impressive. I mean, this, the width of this facility here is about 60 metres. So this, what we're looking at here, this wing here, is just half of it. So that's reproduced on the, this is sort of the, the preparation room. Um, there's the, it's mirrored again on the other side here. So these are the outside flights across the front. And there, then there's all these cages and of course you can open little hatches here to let them into those into those outside flights. Um, I, think, I don't think it's that dissimilar to what Mike had at his property. Unfortunately, I never went to one of those Save the Gouldian days, but I think, in fact, a lot of stuff came from there. Sorry. No, it's not. No, no it's within within um, ANU in Canberra. Yeah. We could probably organise a, a visit. I don't think that would be impossible. Unfortunately, as, as, as we've mentioned, um, Sarah Pryke, who's the main researcher, has got cancer, and I think she's undergoing chemotherapy at the moment in... South Africa. So the actual research is not really taking place at this point in time. Um, this is that private cattle station that I mentioned. So this is 400 k's to the north of um, 
um, Maroop, so you know, far north Queensland basically. So they've at the moment got in here at this point in time, there's in the order of five to eight hundred birds ready for release. So they breed them. This is this is in the middle of the cattle station. They've set up these aviaries. There's, I, I have got some other photos that I could show you, but they're substantial aviaries. And that within them, see this sort of chook mesh contraption here. A bit hard to tell in that photo, but that's actually the feed stations. So they've got those inside the aviary and outside the aviary. They've got aviaries for soft release, so birds can come and go. Um, these feeders are all over the property, so that when birds are released, they recognise them as feeders. They're a safe place. Obviously, hawks and predators can't get into those, and they know that because they were they were born in there. So they're only releasing birds that, that were actually raised on that property. So this is a private landholder that's, that's, that's organised all this. And there's two of them. Um, and we're not supposed to know, it, 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 they don't want their name to be known and they don't want to know the details of it. So there's some private people that are doing it. Um, the Red Siskin stuff, you obviously know about that because we've talked about that in the past, we just had the visit from, from them. Um, CITES Appendix 1, so that's basically it's um, the most restrictive in terms of critically endangered, it's um, top of the top of the pop. Um, we've been recognised now again. That's the Save the Gordian Fund in a sense. That was the initial, well, one of the connections to Australia. The other connection was via Paul Kevill, actually, who somehow spotted it. I don't know how he spotted it and um, mentioned it to me. And then I think it was in the last magazine. And then I rang him up and you know, just lost half my life. <laughs> well. <laughs> It's exactly the thing that, that, that I was interested in, so it was very cool. Um, so it's a massive, massive program, massive program. Like there's a lot of funding from, from um, the US government and from the Venezuelan government and from the Ghanaian government as well. Um, we're just a small part of it, the captive breeding part of it that, that, that we're sort of been involved in and the, and the tour that Warren had. Um, to see how we breed them, because we're pretty much the only country that I'm aware of that, that's been breeding red siskins in, in big aviaries. Everywhere else they're breeding cabinets. Um, so that was great. But of course, it's a huge program. There's a lot more to it um, than just breeding the birds. Um, the, next, the next bit that we'll be involved in is the genetic testing stuff, probably, to have a look at what our red siskins are like, whether they're any use, the bloodlines that we've got to, to um, in terms of captive breeding and release later on down the track. Um, as you know, they've declined massively over the last few years, mainly due to trapping in this case, trapping for the avicultural industry. So the least we can do is give a little bit back by helping these birds. Um, it's a massively, every in Venezuela, it's everybody knows what a red siskin is, basically. So there's national conservation campaigns, um, and the red siskin, you know, it, it rates. And yet South America, I mean, the, the the unbelievable wildlife that's in South America, and let this little little red bird is significant. Um, it's on there. This is this is the, the equivalent of, the, of our hundred dollar bill. Has red siskins on it. So. Don't know how many people in Venezuela have the equivalent of a hundred dollar bill, but you know, I suppose they've seen them and, and would like to have it. So it's 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 huge. You know, there's a huge awareness of the bird in Venezuela. Um, this is their red book that lists all the endangered species in Venezuela, and look what's on the cover: a red siskin. So it's just showing just how massive it is in Venezuela. Um, this is when this this is um, the front page of the the main the equivalent of the Sydney Morning Herald in Caracas, which is the capital of Venezuela. When the I don't know what all that says, but when they first went over, when the Smithsonian first went over and started this program, it's front page news. So front page, you know, imagine having finches on the front page of Sydney Morning Herald. Can't imagine it. <laughs> um, so we're getting massive exposure to this, and and we're involved in it, and. What's strange is they've come here to see how we captive breed red siskins, and yet for the Americans at the Smithsonian, Washington, they're trying. There's no. It's very difficult for now. Now, at the at the Smithsonian that Warren works at, um, which is at the just captive breeding birds for endangered species, he now has 12, 12 red siskins. Okay, so. 
that's it. It's taken him months and months to get 12 by, because every time, because he works for the federal government, obviously being the Smithsonian, someone advertises in the bird press over there, he rings them up, so, and, and because it's Society's Appendix 1, they've got to have paperwork and all that sort of stuff, he rings them up, as soon as they, um, they hear that he's from the federal government, well normally they just hang up, or if they don't hang up, they say, well, look, you can come and get them. I understand. I want to help, but there's no, there'll be no paperwork. You just come pick. Well, he can't do it. So a couple of times he's driven, you know, he drives across a couple of states and, and finds that, uh, you know, they've got no paperwork or whatever, so he can't pick them up. Or then even if they have got paperwork, he's got to drive them back. And, ha and, there's, and it's like a lot of our um, exotics. Unfortunately, the Red Seas is not one of them. They've all got mutations through them. And most of the mutations have been put into them by hybridising them with other related species to get the cinnamon in or to get the whatever in, the pied or the whatever else. So they're not actually pure red siskins. Um, so we're, we're, we're unlucky that we don't have all these millions of different species of siskins in Australia because it would be nice to have some of the other ones. But we're lucky in a way because in a sense I think that's what's protected the red siskin, that we've only got the red siskins and the, and the yellow ones. Um, so that in itself is sort of, well, we did have some others, I think, at some stage earlier on, but, but basically, for whatever reason, we have kept them, um, well, they appears to be pretty pure. Um, so it's a huge project. There's a lot of field research. So there's field researchers going out, looking at them in the wild, photographing them, taking samples, working out how many there are, looking at the habitat, all that sort of stuff. Um, there's the molecular research, which is they've now, um, what do they call it, mapped the DNA, the genome of the red siskin. So the next step will be then to get samples of wild red siskins and try and find out just how related all the populations are and also check whether the ones they've got in the US, like are they, how, are they, how much red siskin is actually in the red siskins in the US. And they'll probably do the same thing with blood samples from our birds. Um, so we're involved in that and the genetic diversity stuff because they obviously need to know what the diversity of the population is before they decide where they're going to go with this captive breeding and release. Is it possible? Is the, are the birds in agriculture of use to the wild birds? Um, then there's the captive brooding stuff that we've been involved in. So we've been involved in, in talk, like Warren's the head keeper from, um, that's going to be in charge of the whole, the whole program in the US and then he'll go to Venezuela where they're going to build a big facility there at the, or two of the zoos that'll, that'll have facilities for red siskin brooding, one major one that'll be built. So the idea is that he goes there and, and tells all the Venezuelan keepers how to do it um, based on um, what Joe Cavill does and Graham Wagster, no, and others. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the theory is, whether they get to this, is they'll brood heaps of them in the zoos for possible reintroduction. And then also the Caracas Zoo will be as much a outreach thing to, to advertise the program, the main, so it's kind of like Taronga, I guess, in Caracas. Um, there's a lot of other stuff going on though too. Probably this reintroduction and monitoring thing is bigger than all the others put together. Shade coffee is, because where they're found is actually about 500 metres above sea level, so they're not, I always thought it was in a real humid place, but actually it's not humid. Once, once you go inland, apparently it becomes quite dry woodland, and that's where they are, but that's also where they grow. So they, there's this, this, this thing called shade coffee, where they grow the coffee in amongst the natural woodland. So what they're doing is, that, and, that, and that just happens to be the same um, habitat that the red siskins are in. So they're jumping on the bandwagon with that. So they're using this shade coffee sort of conservation idea to promote the red siskins and, and, and you know, sort of getting, getting coffee farmers to protect the red siskins, basically, even to the extent that they may be employing some of the trappers and things like that to work to conserve the bird. Because obviously, as, as we know from our experience in Australia, often it's the trappers that are the best ones to know what to do to keep the stocks in the wild. They certainly know where to find them, but they probably also know, know their habits better than um, a lot of other people. Um, so there's that going on, and then um, obviously there's a lot of education stuff going on, monitoring the population as it happened, and enforcement, because the risk is there. Well, you can, if, if you're a, on the, the, you know, the, not, the average Venezuelan, if you sell a, a pair of red siskins, sells for the equivalent of a month's wages. So if you're a starving, bloke with a family and, you know, well, what do you do? You know, do you trap a pair of red siskins so you can feed your kids for the month? 
I don't think it's a no-brainer. Of course, a lot of us would. Um, so they've got a that's that's the biggest problem probably in the whole in the whole mix. Um, and some of these things are about sorting that out. Um, so these are the three main organisations that were involved in the Red Siskin Initiative, us and all the clubs, um, National Finch and Softball Association and Canary and Cagebird Federation, they all contributed funds um, and, we'll, and, and it's ongoing. We've still got some funds in our account for this stuff. Um, so in terms of what we're talking about with captive breeding, we do, we're acknowledged, people across the world, they acknowledge that Australians do lead the world in terms of breeding stuff in large planted aviaries. Um, in terms of the red siskins, as I said, we've got potentially significant genetic material too. Um, but the way that we breed them is obviously much more suitable to captive breeding and release programs than people who breed them in cabinets. Um, here's just, I think I showed you some of these. So that was um, Charlie Cordina's, that's Finn Scouchy's when we had the trip over here. That was John Airy's, Joe's, uh, Mick Rixty's, um, this is my place. And then um, the video that maybe some of you have seen that I took at Graham Wagstaff's that's um, they're going to use for help training as well, which was, it, Graham certainly got the gift of the gab in terms of doing the tour through his aviaries, if anybody's ever been there and bought it. It's worth going and buying, a, buy, just buy a cheap bird to go there, it'll give you the full tour. It only costs you 20 bucks for whatever his cheapest bird is. It's a good tour. <laughs> He's got it down pat, I've seen it a few times. It does a good job. You learn a lot. <laughs> um, some other examples, what's that? Yeah, I'm a bit boring. <laughs> um, but Graham's got the best birds in the world too, as, as anybody who's been to Graham's would know. Um, another one, the orange-bellied parrot that you've probably heard a lot about. They've been mucking around with these things for God knows how long, 30 years. I don't know how much money's been put into it. Millions, probably. Um, now, there's the habitat thing, which is a totally different thing, but in terms of the captive breeding, I've been mucking around with them forever. Um, with some success... I mean, they've kept them alive and they've got 300 odd in captivity, but how many's in the wild? 20 or 30, and how long has they been? 20 or 30, for as long as I can remember. So this is not a huge, hugely successful um, venture in terms of, if you looked at it purely economically. In terms of return on investment, it's a shit job. You know, it really is a shit job. But things are starting to happen now. So private agriculture is now involved. Daniel Gowland's got them. He's at Pream, um, and from what I saw when we were down there, he's bred a couple, more than a couple, like more than well, I don't know. The number I saw seemed to be more than what I've officially understand he's bred. So not that you didn't hear me say that, but um, he's doing pretty well with them, I would say, um, which is fantastic. Um, it's fantastic for the orange bellied parrot, it's fantastic for Daniel and Priam, but it's fantastic for Australian aviculture, more importantly, and, and what this means in terms of, you know, some of us maybe later on getting involved in endangered species work. Um, so what he does, so what aviculture does works. And we know it works because we're all doing it. We do it every day. And most of us have been doing it since we were little kids. We started at the age that Sebastian's at, and we just... Like most of the people in this room have been doing it since they were kids, you see a bird and you just know that it's breeding or it's sick or it's, you know what I mean? It's a, it, it, I don't know how you teach people that. Um, so that's really what it's about. Um, oh, this is, that's where Daniel has the orange belly parrots, so they're behind that. In fact, all these breeding parrots are sort of behind shade cloth. The idea is that the birds feel safe, like, like, like they're in vegetation. So they, they feel safe from predators. They feel that you can't see them, and you can't see them because of shackles and all that. But that's the idea. They can see out, and they can see the predators approaching, or the threats, but, um, but the predator can't see them. So they're happy for you to walk past. Mind you, some of the Amazons and macaws definitely knew we were, like they, well, they went off their nut when they saw us walk past. <laughs> they really made a racket. Um, but Daniel, Daniel's very particular, like the, the design of his nest boxes. You know, if a nest box doesn't work, he tries a different design. Like he'd have, 
you know, there's dozens of different nest boxes with holes here and holes there and two holes so the hen, cock can go in, the hen can jump out if he needs to and all sorts of, all sorts of things. You know, he's can, he really is, like, like a, he, he treats it as a science. You know, if something's not working, try something else because there's no point continuing to try what's not working. And I mean, he's obviously doing well. Fantastic looking property too. It's on about, I don't know how big it is, 20 hectares or so. So the, the Avery banks are well spread out. It's down at Bungendore where it snows. So it'd be an absolute disaster walking around the snow <laughs> between the banks of Avery's, I suppose. But um, it certainly is picturesque. Um, that's, that's one bank of his suspended Avery's. There's another shot here. So that, um, the height of that, that, if you stood there, that would be, be about that high. So this is huge. So this is like whatever, four metres to the base of that suspended. So in there, he's got a pair of, I think they're green wing macaws, yellow tail blacks, and I think there's a pair of Amazons in there too. All three of them breeding in there, which is very unusual, I think, for parrots. Um, then he's also got big flights like that as socialising flights for the young birds, where they're put in to sort of mix and even just pair, find who they want to pair up with. Um, so he's almost doing what we do with big planted finch avery's, I suppose, with these... With, um, with big parrots. Um, Daniel's also got a lot of really good connections in Canberra because he lives near Canberra and he's, he and his dad have been at it for... I, mean, so I know some people don't necessarily like what the gallons, the, the mentality of the gallons, some of the parrot people are against him, but to my mind, he knows how to work the, work the government to his favour and, and he's very supportive of other, the rest of agriculture getting involved too. Um, so he's terrific. Um, what, what, are we, what needs to happen? Well, the first thing is we've got to believe that it can happen because people always poo-poo it and think, oh, you know, they'll never let us have them, blah, blah, blah. Well, of course they won't because we never asked. That's the reality. I, to be honest, before I got involved in, at, at, you know, as president of this club, I thought there was a lot more going on. I thought there were a lot more people writing submissions and a lot more stuff going on. The first one I wrote when I was president was there was that feral bird issue in Victoria. You know what it turned out to be? I was the only one who wrote a submission. I was the only one. And that's the same with this Victorian exotics thing. Even the Victorians, it took them about eight months before they wrote a submission. I was like, what? So why did the minister give me a meeting before she gave the Victorians? Because nobody else asked. That's the reality. You don't ask, you don't get. You can you can get the shits with the bureaucrats and the politicians all you like. And there's plenty to get the shits with them about. Don't worry about that. But I mean, if you don't ask, you can't expect them to 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 give. They don't even know what we. They don't even know who we are. They have no idea we exist. So we have to promote ourselves, and we have to believe in ourselves. Um, engage with significant people like the politicians, the zoos, and so on. Um, identify the species that we that we're interested in. Um, and get experience with analogue species, which we've, we've already sort of got in a lot of cases. Um, and I'll go through a couple of examples in a minute. Um, the breeder groups that are already happening informally, in some cases a little bit formally, in, like with the QFS work, um, but that has to be formalised if you're going to be working with endangered species. You have to do the paperwork, you just have no choice. Um, you've got to do all the bullshit and you know, write the 200 page garbage that no one will ever read. But you do have to do it, or you'll never get. It'll never happen if you don't. And there's people who are willing to help. Um, someone mentioned Graham Phipps to me. I can't remember who it was. Graham is passionate about doing this too. He was curator at Taronga. If you don't know him, we'll get him here some stage to talk. Um, he's passionate to, to get this underway. Um, so, and he's got some kudos, obviously, in the industry. Whether you like Graham or not, he's certainly known um, and has the experience. And there's a few other people like that too. Um, Okay, so here's, 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 here's my what, what, what do we do? Talk about it. Tell people what we do. Be proud of what we do. Don't think, like think of it as a bit more than just a hobby. There's some, there is a greater good to this. There is a greater good to this. So it's worth promoting. It's not just keeping a couple of finches in the backyard. It doesn't have to be just that. It can have, can have a, a more meaningful purpose. Um, like I said at the very beginning, be thankful for what we've got. Yes, we have to 
get up and argue about this and that we'd like to bring in some new whatever it is, tannages from South America or whatever it is, that'd be great, terrific. But we've also got to be bloody thank thankful for what we've got. The fact that we can keep natives means that any of this is possible. We take that for granted. It just doesn't happen in a lot of other Western countries. And we're going, we have to protect that too. We have to protect that too. Because we will get hammered for, for sure. For sure the animal livers all, and, and some of the do-gooders will, will come down on us and the first thing that they'll do is try and stop us keeping natives. That's obvious. That's what I'd do if I was them. It's happened in other countries. Why the hell wouldn't they do that first year? So we, by doing this sort of stuff like critically endangered or endangered species work, we then lift ourselves above just being a hobby and we make it very difficult for those people to... Well, it, it, it's very difficult for them to argue their case if we are actually helping with captive breeding programs and protecting our native species here. Um, think about, like, to me, my whole life in aviculture has been about doing this. Like when I first started as a kid, so when I was your age, Sebastian, I had exhibition budgies. So I was breeding, and I remember a good mate of mine who lived up, up um, where you guys, French's Forest are from, he lived at Alambi Heights. He had Lutinos, some really good Lutino budgies. He gave me one cock. And I thought, oh, I thought oh, it was Christmas. This bloke who's got a bloody decent bird's given me one. And I bred millions of Lutino. I did really well with them. So to me, in my little world, I'd established Lutinos in my aviaries and I'd, and I'd, and I'd you know, line bred them and all the rest of it and selected for the traits that I liked. In that case, it was the fact that they were a really decent colour. Doesn't seem to matter for much, I don't think, with budgies these days from the ones I've seen. But that was the aim then. And that skill is exactly the same skill now when I'm trying to breed these... Well, it's slightly different. When I'm trying to, you know, establish whatever species it is in my aviaries, at the moment, like splendid wrens, for instance. So I've only just got them... I've bred five, I've organised with a few other people, we're going to swap a few around, I'll get another couple of pairs going so that I can have a sustainable population of them. So it's not just one pair and I breed a couple, I bred them now, piss them off, get something else. Um, and that's what most of us do, whether it's establishing mutation or establishing a species in your aviaries. Um, and pragmatically, we are the cheap option. There's no doubt about that. There's lots of little brown jobs that are critically endangered all over Australia and no zoo gives a shit about them and nobody else really gives... Well, they sort of give a shit, but they're not going to take them on. They're not, a, they're not something that you can make into a stuffed toy. Um, so there's no, there's, no, there's no sort of advantage or there's no real money in it for them. But you know what? We're completely mad and the, that little brown guy there where there's only 500 of them left in the world or something, for us to be able to take that little brown guy and breed heaps of them and, 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 and maintain that species forever would be a huge thing, even though it is an ugly little brown thing to, to other people. Um, and you know what? We're crazy enough we'll do it for free. Um, so we need to get organised and do it professionally. That's not to say that everybody has to. But we need to have organised groups and within that group we do and there are people, there are people sitting in this room who can write these submissions. And I'll tell you what, there's people sitting in this room who write these submissions far better than the ones that I've read that are written by the, 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 the so-called professionals. They're not rocket science. They're, it's really not rocket science, the stuff they write. Um, but we've got to accept that that's got to happen. Nobody's going to come and say, Bob, could you please take some of these Malleamurids and have a go at breeding them, you know, and can you take and They're just not going to do that. We've got to be proactive. Um, so write submissions. I'll show, I can show you some captive management plans at some stage. Thank you. Um, they're not hard. Well, basically the zoo has like a, it's like a telephone book for all the species that they have and all it has is how many each zoo's got. So Taronga has seven cocks, three hens, five unsexed, and they'd like to have another five. Whereas some others, Adelaide Zoo, has da, 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 they'd like to get rid of five. You know, it's just a list of all the species. That's, you know what? It's not much. That's basically what it is. Like yeah, it's just it's the same. Um, so some of the contacts, so we've got zoo contacts. We already have a lot of zoo contacts already. 
um, including public, well, we had Steve Sass was here a couple of months ago. So he's part of the Zoo mob. Daniel Gowland is part of the Zoo mob. Um, Taronga people, Featherdale people are, are involved um, in the AV Society and, and, have, and have been to these meetings many times. We've got academic contacts, Simon Griffith, um, Rowan in the conservation area, there's a few. Rowan Clark I've been talking to. Um, there's a whole heap of people um, that are in the academic world that are understand that we can do it and are behind us. Um, business people too, um, we've got to get involved. Um, Threatened Species Commissioner Gregory, I've been involved in him. I'm going to write him a letter shortly. He's quite interested to find out about all this sort of stuff. Um, the meeting we had with the US Ambassador, he's probably, he's like super into it. Um, and then of course we've got to, you know, you've got to get the MPs and ministers and things as the last step to sort of give it the thumb up if it's really going to happen. Um, I'll just go through a couple, quickly, through a couple of birds. This, the Threatened Species Commissioner, with Greg Hunt, who's the Environment Minister at the federal level, this is their, these are the 20, 20, 20 birds by 2020, they call it. And there's a document, you can read it online if you want. These are the 20 endangered birds. I don't know why these species got to be on the list. There's a heap of others, but these species are on the list. So there's, there's um, um, money and there's an impetus to make something happen at the political level. So the Rugen honey eater, that's the one that um, Taronga's got heaps of them, and I mean heaps. Like they're breeding them, no problem. Um, now I have New Holland honey eaters, there's lots of other breeders around the country who've got related species to the Rugen honey eater, or I, you might call them analog species, um, that are breeding them successfully and have done for I've only just started with softbills, there's people who have been breeding for a long time. Um, so they're already, that's basically happening already in captivity. The helmeted honey eater, that's the same species as the yellow tufted honey eater. I've got a pair of them. This is a subspecies, I think it's the state bird of Victoria. Hillsville Sanctuary's been breeding those things for years. They've done a great job, don't get me wrong, they've bred heaps of them. But it's just a subspecies of the yellow tufted honey eater. People in aviculture have been breeding yellow tufted honey eaters forever in captivity. It's the same bird. Healesville Sanctuary, yeah, doing a great job. How much money have they been given to breed helmeted honey eaters over the years? I don't know. Be millions. Be millions. And yet people in aviculture are breeding the same bloody bird and get doing it because they just like having them in the backyard. Um, the orange-bellied parrot we've already talked about. Swift parrot's another one in, in Tasmania, although I believe that it's, so it's um, under threat again. Golden shouldered parrot, there's been work up in, in Queensland. Um, and then there's all these other ones. The ones that I think are a, a reasonable target species for us to look at is the Malliemu wren, the yellow chat, the helmeted honey eater again, because we've already got them, and the plains wanderer that I've spoken about before. Um, so the Malliemu wren, these little guys come from this area, which is the Mali area. They live in, they're only tiny, apparently they can get out through half inch mesh. They're called emu wrens because they've got like an emu feather for a tail. Tiny little blokes, so they can get out like an orange breast kind of wren. Really small. Um, there's bugger all of them left. They live in very low heath and they're pretty weak flyers. So a family that lives in this little habitat here, if a fire goes through, they're buggered. They can't, they, they'll be battling to get the kilometre to the next little bit of stuff, right? So it's got to the stage, there's so few of them that um, the researchers are concerned that one decent fire that goes through that Mallee country will wipe them out and they'll be gone for good. So there's impetus and they're keen to bring some into captivity and get on with this. Now, not many emu wrens have been bred in captivity, if any, um, but there's plenty of wrens. There's plenty of people breeding wrens in captivity. Um, so this is, this is a good one, I think, to have a, have a go at. Um, so analog species are other emu wrens. There's, the good thing is the southern and the rufous crowned emu wrens, which are very closely related to these guys, there's heaps of them. There's heaps of them in the wild. So it'd be no problem to go and get 20 pairs of each of those, or one, or one of those species out and give them to some of us or whatever and we get the management right with those. We muck around with those for a few years. We learn how to breed whichever rufous crowned emu wrens in captivity we get them established in aviculture, we've got heaps of them, we know how to do it, 
and then we start mucking around with these blokes. That to me makes perfect sense. But you know what? It doesn't make sense to the people who are writing the recovery programs because they don't have the resources to do that. It costs them too much to muck around with that. Um, next one, Helmet and Honey, I spoke about that already. Um, so this is, this is the range of the yellow tufted honey eater, that yellow bit. The helmeted honey eater has only found this very small area here. So it's, it's just, it's a subspecies. Um, so the thing is, we're already breeding them, so it makes sense for us to just breed a different subspecies, basically, the ones we're already breeding. Um, yellow chat, there's heaps of the nominant, there's a quite a number of subspecies, heaps of the nominant, this is the nominant one. But it's this alligator rivers subspecies that's uh, critically endangered. They're found up the top here in that area, only in a small area. Not many of them left. So the yellow chat itself is not endangered, but this alligator rivers subspecies is highly endangered. So again, the yellow chat's not in captivity at the moment. It's not in aviculture. But the orange chat, the crimson chat, and the white fronted chat is. I'm breeding orange chats. They're not rocket science. You know what? If you've got a normal planted aviary, backyard aviary, you could put a pair of orange chats in there, they'd breed. The only thing is you've got to have a hell of a lot of live food. <laughs> Unbelievable the amount they eat when they're breeding. Same with crimson chats. I don't have crimson chats, but the same thing. Um, I think probably the orange chat and the crimson chat are most similar to the yellow chat. The white fronted chat's a little bit different, comes from coastal areas, um, but they, they breed all right too. So we've already got these sorted. We know how to breed them already. So it makes sense for us to get involved in that species. Um, and the plains wanderer that we've talked about because the only real records of breeding those things in captivities are from aviculture. I've got two unofficial records. Graham Phipps, who I mentioned, is on the recovery team for the plains wanderer. Um, Taronga Zoo has just taken, I don't know, I forget how many. Do you remember, Ben? A couple of pairs? Not many. A few pairs they managed to grab from the wild to try and get the management right. I mean, just like what I've heard from the people who've had them in the past, they chucked them in an aviary and like quail, what do you think happened? The hens started laying eggs all over the place. So the logical thing to me, and Randra, sheep farmer, noticed there wasn't many, wasn't many plains wanderers on his property. So what he started to do, just when he's going about his daily, daily business, you know, riding around the property, if he saw some plains wanderer eggs, um, either in a nest or just, you know, randomly. He'd pick them up, take them back, and he had a chook incubator, put them in the incubator, incubate the things, let them hatch, grow them up, <laughs> and then he'd let them go. You know, once they got to be of, of an age that they could look after themselves. So, to me, that's, it, like in this recovery program, honestly, I read it, I think, why don't they just do that? Like, they're like chooks. If you, if, if you take the eggs, you know what? They'll just lay again. So you're not even really making any difference to the wild population. And the other thing with them, when you take them, when you take an adult from the wild, like a typical quail, they go absolutely nuts, you know, and just continually, every time anyone goes near and the bloody things fly up and try and scalp themselves on the roof and, you know, go crazy. Whereas obviously if you just collect the eggs and hatch them and raise them, um, they'll be fine. So, so that's another one that, that makes sense. And from, from the, 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 the few records that we've got of these guys, pretty hard to kill. They're pretty tough in an aviary situation. So, that, whereas the emu wrens are the opposite. They're like, you get a mally emu wren, it'll probably be dead before you, like, that, that, that'd be a huge thing to move them from the wild and get and acclimatise them to captivity. Whereas with these guys, they might scout themselves, but they're pretty tough. Um, so that's why we sort of picked those as a possible. Um, so we've, got to, so we've got some threatened foreign finch species as well. That, 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 so these are threatened in the wild. Red siskin we've talked about. The Java sparrow is surprisingly threatened as well. I think probably from being poisoned and so on because it was raiding crops. Um, the green strawberry is um, endangered in its native India. I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if there's any left at all in Australia now, but the, whatever's left would be just living out the last, last days. But I mean, that'd be, that'd be a good one for us to get involved in because wouldn't it be great to import some more back into Australia and re-establish them? And even better if we can do it as part of a conservation program. And the other one that's close to us that I've seen is the Royal Parrot Finch in Vanuatu, which would be another finch that's, that's a good one because they're endangered in, in the wild in Vanuatu. Um, 
and of course the southern blackthroat finches that we know about, they've just been um, declared extinct in New South Wales. I think they probably already were, but whatever the official, I don't know what, how they do it, you know, someone hasn't seen one for 10 years, so we decide that it actually is extinct. So, um, and obviously we've got, we've got good stock of them. I mean, that'd be a great one. Could, could we organise a future release program back into that Inverell area where they once were? Um, maybe. But it's important to keep pure stock of them. Um, so why do we want to do all this? For the challenge, same, same sort of challenge as getting a new species and breeding that. Wouldn't it be great to do it with an endangered species instead? Um, saving a species would be a pretty awesome thing to think about as you're on your deathbed taking your last breath. Think, oh yeah, those little brown guys are still here because of me or something, you know. Um, huge one is promoting aviculture because we're going to get hit by PETA and the animal lib libbers at some stage, probably sooner rather than later. So if we can do something like this, then suddenly aviculture's not people keeping poor little birds in cages anymore, is it? It's, a, it's, it's, it's got a greater cause. Um, and we can, we're already, the way I look at it, we're already doing it. We're already doing it. We just, we just need to get organised and do it with, we just be doing it with different species. It doesn't matter whether you're an exhibition canary breeder or a, or a mutation breeder or, a, or just a normal finch breeder or someone like me who sort of thinks, oh yeah, I'll have a go at one of them, at that species one day, you know, and I buy them and try and establish them around them. That, it, it's all pretty much the same kind of process, you know. You, the canary bloke's line breeding his canaries and making sure that he doesn't get them too inbred. The budgie people are doing the same thing that, you know, the, 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 the mutation bloke, well, he, he starts with one bird that's got a bit of colour in it, one bird, and manages to establish that. So, at least with endangered species, you've got more than one bird, haven't you? Um, and and manage to establish it in captivity. Um, and the big one is we're cheap. We're really cheap. Like, be nice to at least get some funding, wouldn't it? But the reality is, there's a lot of blokes sitting, in, sitting, in front, sitting here in this room who do it for free. They'll build an aviary, they'll feed them, you know, they'll sit there 10 hours a day staring at them and recording every move they make and, and you know, they'll be wandering around catching bugs to feed, all this crap, you know, that a lot of us do. And we'll do it for free. We'll do it for free, you know. So we're probably the only hope for some of those species. Um, and the other, the other thought we had was... Um, it'll help if we want to actually import other, other birds to open the borders. So it might help so that we can get some stuff that we'd just like to have because they're cool birds, you know. Um, but maybe it also means that we can help, like Daniel Gallen's keen, he's been working um, with the mob in Germany on the, well he sent glossy blacks over there, involved with the Spix macaws, you know, the Rio blue bird, that, well, how many were they down to, two or three or something? I don't know how many they got now, but a, a fair number more. So it would make sense that, that, you know, obviously that's not going to be for everyone, that the top breeders in the world can share bloodlines all over the world. Like, with, that, that's how it should be. Um, and maybe it, in, it helps us just get imports going. Um, and as we mentioned before, the extreme animal lib people, it's a good way to counteract their efforts. And... That's a lot. And this is some video I took that they're going to, this red siskin mob are going to, I set up a camera really close and then put some, this is um, the Niger, it's actually that's the frozen stuff that I took out the freezer to put there to get them to, um, to eat it, to try and get a close up shot. So I sort of had, what's that camera? I had that camera right there and put the stuff right there to film them. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,